Welcome to our Wednesday edition of Follow the Reader. I'm really excited if you're joining me today. I hope that you've been having a phenomenal week. Today's guest is someone who is world renowned as a spiritual leader, specifically for two books that you may have heard of that he's authored. We're going to be talking about both those books today as well. You'll be able to download that book and buy the look at book as well if you go onto the link from Amazon, which will be in our Facebook comments. So look out for that in the comments section. And today you'll be able to ask him your questions live and in real time on the show. So I'm very excited to have with us someone who's been a monk for 40 years. He's a spiritual activist a community builder and a New York Times best-selling author. And in the studio, we're joined today for this conversation, for this Follow the Reader session with Radhanath Swami. So I'd love to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jay. I'm so honored and grateful to be with you and your wonderful audience. Well, we're really grateful to have you here today. And I know that there was a lot of love, a lot of interest in your topics. Some people said they'd already read your books. And a lot of people said they had a lot of questions for you. And one of the first questions I wanted to start with is, so your latest book, The Journey Within, this is the book that we're talking about today. You can see it there. It's a New York Times bestseller. And in this book, of course, it's titled The Journey Within. I, I wanted to start off by actually asking you, how does someone even come to the point of starting their journey within? I think we always talk about travel as being a big trend. People are really excited about going to different countries, traveling the world. But here you're talking about the journey within. How did that journey begin for you? One thing we all have in common is the search for happiness. <clears throat> in the Vedas, there's a beautiful verse, Ananda Mayobhyashat. It's a universal principle, whether we're little ants or cockroaches or animals or any variety of human beings, everyone is looking for pleasure. There's an analogy in the Himalayas I learned long ago when I lived there of a deer that has a particular gland that creates a fragrance called musk. That deer is so attracted by the fragrance, wants to find it, and spends his whole life crossing rivers, going over mountains, going into thorny bushes, trying to find that fragrance, not knowing that it's actually within himself. In the same way, we're all looking for happiness. We're trying to find it through wealth, through power, for sexual pleasures, through acquisition of property and money, through entertainment. But somehow or other, that happiness it has beginning, it has an end, and it has so many limitations and vulnerabilities. True happiness, all the great sages and rishis from all the spiritual traditions throughout the world have taught us that that happiness is within ourselves, where sits the actual, the atma, or the living force. And things could give some degree of pleasure for some time to the mind and senses, but things cannot give fulfillment to the heart. It's only to love and to be loved that we can actually experience pleasure within ourselves. And the origin of that love, from a spiritual perspective, is the true journey within. Amazing. So, I mean, that's an amazing, beautiful encapsulation of the journey within. But I also understand from reading your previous book, The Journey Home, that that journey actually began by you. You've just told us about the Himalayas and a story from, that you heard from there, but your journey started off in the suburbs of Chicago and then actually hitchhiking in that direction towards India. So your journey within also began with a physical journey. Can you tell us a bit about your travels when you started out? Well, I was a teenager in the 1960s. And I saw many situations in the society around me that created both grief and confusion. Because I really believed in the concept of America as the land of the free with liberty and justice for all. But I saw people of another color, specifically the African Americans who I worked with, because I had jobs since I was a teenager, and they were practically imprisoned within ghettos. 
they really didn't have equal rights. They didn't, in many places, they didn't have voting rights. They didn't have the same opportunity for education. And it troubled me. So I got involved in the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King. And the Vietnam War was raging at that time. And I was open for the draft, you know, quite soon. I questioned, why are we there? Many different situations really caused me to question everything about life. And then one of my best friends, his car skid on ice and it went into Lake Michigan and he died. And I was thinking, it seems like the whole world is skidding on ice. So I was a social activist, but I came to a conclusion that the real solution we have to find within ourselves. I heard the statement of Gandhi that we should be the change we want to see in the world. So I believed that that change is something spiritual. So I started studying various spiritual um, paths and I was confused again because I saw in the name of religion there's so much hatred in the name of a loving God much prejudice, much division. So I was at a crossroads. Either I have to reject the concept of religion, or there must be something at the very essence of all of them that really brings about a true transformation from arrogance to humility, from greed to generosity, from hate to love. And I was searching for that essence. And I write in my book, The Journey Home, uh, one of my dear friends was going on a trip to Europe and he invited me to come with him and he was willing to pay for it all. And I went to Europe when I was 19 and the first day my friend was robbed so we didn't have anything. So I ended up just hitchhiking around Europe and making the social scenes. This was in 1970 and eventually I became so oriented towards spirituality. I was going to synagogues and cathedrals, monasteries, um, churches. I was going to museums trying to find some spiritual message in the, in the art. I ended up living in a cave in a forest in an island of Greece and I was crying for direction and it was there that I got the inspiration to go to India. So I hitchhiked through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan and I studied Islam there under some really wonderful Islamic scholars and eventually I made it to India and I went to the Himalayas and studied various forms of yoga, Hinduism, Buddhism and eventually came to a place called Vrindavan, which is like a place of pilgrimage for the path of bhakti. Bhakti means love for God and compassion for all living beings. And bhakti yoga is the path that is meant to awaken that dormant love that's within us. It's incredible that you're talking to us about the 1960s and 70s, yet some of those challenges are so apparent today. I'm sure many people listening to you feel those, they're asking the same questions, that they're feeling the same way when they look at the news. I know that many of you in the audience, when you're sending in your responses, you're asking, there's so many things in the media and the news that are bringing us down or we're quite confused by what's happening. And I've just seen a question coming from Thea. She says, can I make a change to the world with my small efforts? It's a question posed to you. The real change of the world is based on quality, not necessarily quantity. In the Ramayan, there's a beautiful story where Hanuman, who was a very powerful personality, he was building a bridge across an ocean and for a very divine purpose. And he was carrying massive boulders and as he was carrying, he happened to see a little tiny spider 
with his little legs just kicking one grain of sand at a time. And Hanuman stopped to wait for the spider to cross. And Ram, his beloved Lord, told Hanuman that actually that spider is doing every bit as much as you. You're doing what you can, and that spider is doing what he can. So really, the fulfillment and purpose of life is not so much how much we do, but the, the intent in which we do it. And each and every one of us can orient our life in such a way that we're trying to excavate that fulfillment, that peace, and that love that's within us. And as we come closer to that love, then our fulfillment in life is not based on what we can get, but it's what we can give. And each and every one of us, big or small, we can be a part of changing the world. And that's where the true meaning and joy of life is. Kevin, uh, Radhanath, how did you discover your clarity through the confusion of all that you learned on your journey? Yes, sir. It's through confusion, it's through challenges that often inspire us to search deeper. Obstacles are actually great aids to enlightenment and to a deeper meaning in life. When we're content and satisfied with superficial things, then we never really look deeper. So the frustrations and difficulties we endure in the path of life actually can be seen as blessings because they help to make us more aware that there's something deeper, there's something more profound that's really my, my purpose and also my potential. I hope you're engaging and learning from this conversation. I hope that you're taking away these insights and that they're making a difference. Now in this book, you talk about the path of bhakti yoga. Yoga is something that's very popular today. Many people practice yoga. We have a question here from Ben Wiley who says, what would be your three tips for someone wanting to begin exploring bhakti yoga? But maybe before that you can define it for us and then, and then give us three tips on how someone can explore them. The word bhakti in Sanskrit, which is the language of the ancient scriptures of India, it means divine love. Savai pung sang poro dharmo yato bhakti rathokshaje. That the deepest dharma, the highest dharma, is awakening the love that is within us. This love is beyond birth and it's beyond death because it's the nature of our very soul. The beginning of bhakti, like so many paths, is to understand who am I. Until we understand who am I, we can't really understand how I am going to be happy. We're living in this body, but we're not this body. We're the source of life, the witness, seeing through the eyes and hearing through the ears and tasting through the tongue and thinking through the brain. Who am I? The mind is always changing, but I'm the same person. The nature of the atma, or the soul, is that we're a part of God. And to love God is our nature. And when we forget our nature, then we're trying to find the fulfillment of that love in so many of the temporary things of this world. So this body is a very sacred, beautiful vehicle by which we can perform seva, or serve. As, an, as a means of expressing our love. The highest purpose of this body is to express the love within ourselves, whether we're engineers or doctors or lawyers or we're working for the Huffington Post or whether we're mothers or fathers or little swamis. The great opportunity we all have is to discover that love and to express that love in whatever we do. And that's bhakti yoga. Bhakti is the love within us, and yoga means to connect. It means to reconnect us with that love within ourselves. Amazing, thank you so much. And Ben's question, then following on from that, what would be your top three tips for someone wanting to start exploring that? So I think, I think from the viewers, from whenever I read your comments, I definitely notice that 
we have had this identity you know, almost identity search where we have social media profiles, we have a job profile, we have work profiles, we have work titles, social media titles, life titles. We are treated, but we're all trying to understand who we are ourselves and there's this ongoing search. So I think everyone would very much connect with that, that we want to find love within us all. But how does one start that process? Where, where, do, where do we start from? How does it begin? I'd like to share three very beautiful principles in, in the tradition that I follow. First is satsang, to be with people who inspire us, with real positive thought, with real spiritual direction. Satsang is so important. It means to be in the company of people who uplift us as far as possible. Second is sadhana, which means to put some very quality time aside every day for our spiritual practice, to take that journey, to tune into the frequency of grace, of love, of compassion that's within us, to tune into God. In our tradition, God's name is Krishna. God has many names. Krishna means all attractive, all beautiful, whose ultimate power is sweetness and love. And when we put that time aside, we actually establish like a foundation of our values and our, our direction in life. And then sadachar is the third, which means when we're living our life, whether it's our domestic family responsibilities, our occupational duties, our social interactions, we do it with character, in a mood of service rather than exploitation. So Alejandro, you're asking this question. With this toxic political environment we are experiencing, what would be the best way to remain peaceful inside? So I think that's very much been in the dialogue at the moment here, of course, with the election and, and everything else that everyone's seeing in the media. But he says, with this toxic political environment we are experiencing, what would be the best way to remain peaceful inside? Or is that even the best thing you suggest? <laughs> There's toxic, toxicity everywhere. <laughs> There's toxins um, in the environment, in the political atmosphere. And the origin is in people's hearts. Unless we clean the ecology of our own heart and inspire others to do the same, then the pollutions of greed and envy and selfish passion and arrogance and so many illusions, we're going to be an instrument to, whether in a big way or small way, pollute the environment. But if we find that purity within our own hearts, then we could contribute great purity to the world around us. So it's very important, however much pollution there may be, to actually strive to find that um, natural, pure state within us and to try to share that amongst each other. Now I wanted to dive into some of these books uh, because when I've been reading them one of the things I've learned or loved about them is that there are so many great experiences, anecdotes, there's so many real life stories in here. You've, you've been through near death experiences, you've uh, lived through great challenges and this is what I was speaking with Doug about yesterday as well that a lot of people don't see that side of people's lives. We see people who look happy or look positive, but we don't notice that they've actually grown through real struggle. So I, I wanted to pick out a few stories that I'd uh, read here or that I wanted you to share on. I wanted you to also speak about the, uh, the analogy of the tree of life in the Arabian desert that you saw, that you share in this uh, wonderful book, The Journey Within, because I feel that that was such a powerful story. <laughs> <laughs> Just about a year and a half ago, I was invited to Bahrain to speak at the YPO, the Young President's Organization. <clears throat> and the day after my talk, the president of the organization, um, husband and wife, they decided to take me on a tour. They brought me to the Tree of Life, which is a it's actually an enormous tree. It's over 400 years old. It's in the middle of this 
desert where there's not another tree for miles and miles and miles around. It's just sand. And I did a little research on it, and some scientists say that the closest water supply is about an underground stream two kilometers away. Somehow or other it reaches. Others say that it gets its water from the breezes from the from the Persian Gulf that's miles and miles away. And some say that this was the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve once lived. And because it's a holy place, somehow or other the tree's growing by some mystical blessing. But whatever it may be, the tree is covered with beautiful green leaves. And it's learned to strive even in the most difficult place. And for me, when I was sitting under that tree and, and praying for a long time, I was very struck with the feeling of hope. That in every situation, even in the most apparently difficult and hopeless situations, there is hope. If we, if we take shelter, if we focus on that divinity that is within us and within everything that is beyond the limiting vulnerable situations of this world, we can grow sometimes even in the best condition when there is challenges. I hope you like that story. I know when I was reading it, it definitely connected with me so much because so many of you, we're always asking, how do we deal with the negativity around us? How we do we deal with all these challenges around us? But here you can see a beautiful lesson from a tree, a beautiful lesson from nature, uh, defying all odds to make something absolutely what would seem or perceivably impossible. Gabrielle, you say, what about the how in finding the purity within our hearts? How do we find it? It begins by asking that question. <laughs> There's a beautiful statement in the Bible, seek and you shall find. And for each and every one of us, it takes a certain situation in our life to begin that serious search. And when we, when we make that search, then, and, and, we, and we have a sincere heart, then things unfold that are actually beyond our own plans. And we come into cir circumstances and we meet people that actually bring us forward. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? Because we're so used to now like strategic lifestyles or lifestyles based on goals and measurable targets. And everyone through their work experience knows that there are certain deadlines and, and we work in that way, but actually you're saying that this, this journey within or this questioning is actually a lot more open. Is that right? Is that correct? Or how, how would you phrase that better? It's a deeper experience. And ultimately we're all looking for that deeper experience. The deepest experience that we're really all seeking is the love that's within our heart the countless desires, the inevitable frustrations, the longings, all of the various situations in our life, they all stem from that love that's within us. And that's the purpose of all true spiritual paths, to discover that love. And the real expression of that love is compassion. There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita, yad yatva napu naramoham evam yashashi pandava. That when we discover our true nature, then we understand the true nature of everyone. And we see everyone with equal vision. Whether a person is white or black or brown or red or yellow, whether one is from one religion or another religion, from one country or another country, whether one is a human or a dog or a cat or a cow or an elephant, life is sacred. When we understand who we are, we understand the sacredness in all life. And then there's respect. 
and compassion. The greatest joy is to actually uplift another. Paradukaduki, it's a Sanskrit term which explains what are the qualities of an enlightened person. And it's a universal principle. One who sees life in such a way that another's happiness is my happiness and another's sorrow is my sorrow. It's an amazing, amazing way to live. I hope you are all connecting with this phenomenal conversation around how we can start to develop those qualities. Just imagine, for a second, I just want you to imagine if the whole world, we all came to that realization and recognized that all life was sacred and therefore everyone, whether from different backgrounds, different religions, different political parties, right, from what's going on, would be able to acknowledge the fact that actually that's what unites us. It would, it would be an amazing thing. I wanted to dive into that. You've just, you've just brought up a lot of great points. You spoke about service, generosity, and you speak about one personality in this book that I feel really kind of encapsulates it. And I know the page, it takes quite, it's a long story, uh, but it's the story of Sindhu Thai. And you tell this story. Now, I, I know that it's, it requires so much explanation, but I just felt that for the viewers today, for them to, that story encapsulates so beautifully so many of the principles. Do you mind sharing it with us, uh, with the audience as well? Sindhu Thai is quite a well-known person in India. She was the keynote speaker a couple years ago in Mumbai on International Women's Day. She's at that time about 63 years old. And she told the story of her life. She was born and raised in a simple little village in the state of Maharashtra in India. And there was a lot of poverty. And it's a long story, but I'll make it really <laughs> short. But she, she had to go out and herd buffaloes instead of go to school. And gradually she, she figured out how to bring the buffaloes to a pond of water and then run to school. And she'd get sometimes beaten because she was late. And then the buffaloes would go into the pastures and she'd get beaten by farmers. And she said those were the best years of her life. When she was about 10 years old, she was forced to marry a person who was 30 years old. By the time she was 20, she had three sons and she was pregnant. And somehow or other, there was a social condition where a person from the mafia was against her, the local land mafias, and um, told her husband that she was cheating on him and that the child in her womb was not her husband's but was this person who was speaking. And if you don't punish your wife, I'm going to do damage to you. So he kicked his wife, the husband, repeatedly for the purpose of killing her. And she was laying unconscious and he dragged her to a area where the cows were kept so that people would think that she was trampled by cows. And one particular cow had so much compassion on her that that cow stood over her and chased all the other cows away so that she wouldn't be trampled. Hour after hour after hour, that cow was protecting her. And she gave birth to a daughter under the cow and had to cut the umbilical cord with a stone and she embraced that cow and cried and said, just as you protected me when I was in a helpless condition, I vow that I'm going to give my life to protect others. But it was a very difficult situation. She really had nowhere to go. And she was sitting under a tree in the noon. And she was thinking, how can I do anything for anyone when I'm in such a condition. She had this little infant baby with her. And then she saw that the, a branch of the tree was brutally cut by a woodsman and was just hanging by a single shred. And that 
branch was giving shade to her and her little daughter. And she was thinking, yes, that's the answer. No matter what condition I am, I can still help others. And she became the mother of the orphans. She would just find homeless little children of all ages, which is very common in India, and she would be their mother. <laughs> and eventually she, um, she had you know, so many children, and people saw she would learn singing, um, to beg for the children, and to provide for them. And some pious people built an orphanage for her. And it was growing and growing. And over the years, she's had over 1,500 children, and she, more than that, grandchildren. And she said the most fulfilling part of her life was one time about an 80-year-old man came to her orphanage and was homeless, diseased, and destitute and was asking for her help. She recognized it was her ex-husband. And she said, I will help you, but not as your wife, as your mother, and gave him shelter in the orphanage. And she told the children that give him your love because he needs it more than anyone. And she would sometimes tell guests that this is my eldest son, and sometimes he's very naughty. <laughs> So she was telling this whole story. She's gotten um, dozens of international and national awards for her work. And I met her about a year after I heard this story. And we sat together for a couple hours just talking. And she had some people with her. And when it came time for us to part, she said to me that this girl next to me was a, she was like in her 30s. She was really um, smiling the whole time. She said, I want you to, in to introduce. This is one of my daughters. She's a doctor who's taken charge of one of the orphanages. She's the one who was born under the cow. So she taught us that even in a hopeless condition, she looked for hope and she found it. And sometimes the sufferings of life could really make us more compassionate. And she found you know, her strength in devotion to God, who she calls Krishna. <laughs> and she shared that love. She had so much, too. And we all have that love. When I met my beloved spiritual teacher, Prabhupada, I felt something so special that he saw a love in me that I never could imagine existed. When we're with holy people, they see our potential, and they give us faith in our potential. What an incredibly significant story. I can see all of you thoroughly engaged while you're listening to that. I mean to find opportunity in one of the biggest obstacles that many of us would never even face that degree. And being able to give people what we never had is the first step that we can all take in trying to change the world, giving people opportunities that never came around to us. That cycle has to be broken somewhere. And that's something that we can all do as global conscious change makers in our own lives and in the lives of others. Another thing that stuck out to me, which I think we're just covering every topic that's been resonating all week with everyone is really around your example also of the redwood trees that you speak about. And I really feel that the audience will connect with this story too. So do you mind sharing a bit about that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Some time ago, I was with a friend and we were walking through Muir Woods, which is a redwood forest close to San Francisco. Actually, every year I go with this friend there and we like to just be alone and walk through the redwood trees and share our thoughts. This one particular year, as we were going 
through the forest, there was a forest ranger speaking to a group of tourists. And he said, I want to share with you the underground secret of the redwood trees. Now, being from the 60s, something that never leaves my heart is an attraction for underground secrets. <laughs> so I told my friend, let's listen. So he stopped, and he explained how in this forest we find some of the oldest, largest trees in the entire planet. He said, interestingly, the redwood trees, the roots do not grow very deep. And here, it's hilly ground with loose soil. Over the centuries, there has been devastating earthquakes, massive windstorms, snowstorms. How do these trees keep growing? And he was quiet to let everyone think. And then he revealed the underground secret. Just underground, the redwood trees, the roots, they grow out and they reach for the roots of other trees. And when two redwood trees' roots meet, they wrap around each other. They embrace and create a permanent bond. In this way, the trees support each other. And the little tiny redwood trees that are just growing, the giant roots of the ancients, they wrap their little red light roots around them. And in this way, they're all helping each other. The, the ranger said, every tree in the entire forest is directly or indirectly supporting each other. Now, the roots of our lives is our heart's affection. When we actually care about each other and share what we have with each other, unity is our strength. And this story of the Redwood Forest, despite all the storms and challenges of life, we can continue to grow and grow and grow. And we need each other to do that. What a beautiful message of hope, courage, enthusiasm, passion for every single one of us all in testing times, in challenging times, in any obstacles, any situations that you're dealing with. I hope that you've enjoyed our conversation today. I hope that you've really taken away some nuggets of wisdom, some inspirational insights that you can apply into your daily lives, apply into the context and dialogue of your own internal minds and hearts. And if you do want to find out more, you can, of course, uh, order the book, The Journey Within. We will pop the link into the comment section so you can order it off Amazon. It is available in the first book, The Journey Home, as well. The question that's asking here, just to finish off, Radhan Swami, is, is there another journey to be had? So is there another book? So we have the journey home and the journey within. Is there a further journey that humans need to take? <laughs> <laughs> In our tradition, we have a meditation of chanting God's names. And through the compassion and the love that awakens through that, we can actually re we can extend the roots of our real concern to to uplift each other and that's the real journey you know when we go on this journey within then the next journey is how we express that through our words through our actions and through our life See, amazing. Thank you so much for being tuned in online with us today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Radhanath Swami, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure. We're extremely grateful that you could join us today. And if there's any last words you'd like to leave us with, then uh, please share them. But thank you so much for being here. I'm very grateful. Thank you so I'm much. I'm very sir. grateful. And everyone, please um, appreciate the potential that we all have that the great sages, the great rishis, the great yogis, the great philosophers throughout history have reminded us of that we're all a part of God. And to recognize that in ourselves and in others brings about a spirit of seva, to serve with love, to serve with devotion. And this is the true meaning and purpose that we can all share with each other and be happy.
Thank you so much. So we look forward to serving all of you again tomorrow. We'll be here at the same time, same place with a fantastic guest. So I look forward to you joining me then. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you're tuning in from. Look forward to serving you tomorrow. Thank you so much. See you soon.